entire community was illuminated by electricity generated by an atomic reactor. But less than two years after that dramatic send-off, something went wrong. Some of the fuel rods partially melted. various reasons, including build-ups of radioactivity in the building above the reactor. That's what led to the final shutdown, 13 days after the first signs of trouble. Uh, appalled at the uh, sort of the cavalier attitude that they demonstrated. The official news release claimed there was no indication of unsafe reactor conditions, and newspapers treated the matter routinely. Local public safety officials weren't told much either. That would be unheard of in today's safety atmosphere. Sort of a damn the torpedoes full speed ahead attitude, which is, uh, which is fine if you're fighting a war, I guess, but it's certainly not a way to run a reactor. A, a slipshod operation, I guess, is the way I would describe it. This film is a combination of actual and reenacted scenes. It is presented for the purpose of studying and improving the methods and techniques of handling nuclear emergencies. Today, if you were to take a trip in almost any direction across our great country, you might suddenly come upon a sign such as this, Atomic City. This means the location nearby of one of our atomic energy plants. A potent reminder that we now live in the atomic age. What are such communities like? Atomic cities, cities near atomic plants, are pleasant places of comfortable and well-built family homes. There are modern schools and churches, libraries, hospitals, post offices, with the ever-increasing use of nuclear energy, more towns may eventually become atomic cities, cities near safe and efficient atomic plants. The Susanna reactor started producing power early in November, and our cameras were focused on the town at 7.30 p.m., November 12, 1957. Enrico Fermi once looked at a reactor and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if it could cure the common cold? Here at Moor Park, a chain reaction that started with him washed the dishes, and lit a book for a small boy to read. There was a nuclear accident in the mountains west of Chatsworth. It happened 20 years ago. There was no large-scale public exposure to radiation. But the public has never been given details till now. And tonight, for the first time, Warren's going to tell us the story and show us the film on this. Warren? Thank you, John. Unit 4 has been able to dig up government films and documents that show what happened. Something went wrong. Some of the fuel rods partially melted. The damage turned out to be very extensive. 13 of 43 fuel rods partially melted. 81 pieces of uranium fuel scattered around on the bottom of the core. The SRE was cooled not with water, as most reactors now are, but with sodium, a liquid metal. This animation, on a government film never shown in public before, shows the sodium filling up the reactor, going up between the radioactive fuel rods. When the fuel rods partially melted in 1959, the sodium absorbed the most dangerous of the materials produced by the accident so they stayed in the reactor. But the operators did not know what had happened till some time after the accident occurred. The official reports almost sigh with relief. But it could have turned out differently. Luckily, the fission product release, that is the release of radioactive materials, was contained within the sodium. But there was always a chance that if fuel melting had proceeded unchecked, that it would have been released into the surrounding area especially iodine and strontium. The iodine and strontium are very dangerous because the iodine goes to the thyroid glands of young children, causing thyroid cancer, and the uh, strontium goes to the bones of growing children, causing leukemia. Certainly people were following that reactor all the time. Uh, it did not appear to be a hazard to the public or to our employees, and uh, in retrospect it wasn't a hazard to our employees or public. And we put the plant back on the line. In 1989, the Daily News reported on a secret study conducted by the Department of Energy revealing widespread chemical and radioactive contamination at the site, which had contaminated the mountain. 
Boeing has been ordered by the state to clean up the Santa Susana Field Laboratory, and the company says they have made tremendous progress, but Consumer Watchdog claims instead they've used lobbyists to sidestep the project. Activist Dan Hirsch. Boeing concluded that it's cheaper to hire some well-connected hired guns to get out of their obligations than it is to comply with them. In a statement, Boeing denies all of the charges, but neighbor Bonnie Klee, who is diagnosed with bladder cancer after working at the test site, says she's seen cancer in every house on her block. I don't want the chemicals and the radiological contamination left there. I don't want another generation exposed to what we've been exposed to. Megan Goldsby, KNX 1070 News Radio. My name's Holly Huff. I was diagnosed with CLL which is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Dawn Kowalski, and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Barbara Johnson, and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm Marie Mason. Um, I was diagnosed with a thyroid condition. I have, I had bladder cancer. My son, who lives in Moore Park, also had bladder cancer. Uh, my daughter had half her thyroid removed when she was 21. But to this date, I've had removed about 130 basal cell carcinomas from my face and my body. The worst affected has been my right eye, which is, um, I've had at least 25 tumors around my eye. Was this a minor release? Was it a major release? Was this sort of a, oh my God release? How severe was this? Well, a major release could be, uh, oh my God, what with all those men that disturbed them so bad they had tears in their eyes about them because they weren't able to tell them. Uh, just because of the release and where it went, them decided they could even tell their own wives or family. So it was, it was very, very big. It was. That's why they call it the worst nuclear accident in history in the United States. So this is the part I want to let everybody know about. There's stories about they had the tanks to take and release the, the gases into, but what happened is uh, during that day when they was trying to shut the reactor down, those tanks, those storage tanks, uh, were got, gotten filled up with trying to stop the reactor. To, and there they were, they had the tanks full, everything was, they couldn't do anything. What do we do now? If we don't shut something down, it's gonna blow up. And so what they had to do, they had to release the, the nuclear radiation straight out of the reactor, out in the atmosphere. This has not been talked about, but I was there and I know it happened. It went out all over the San Fernando Valley, went over the eastern end of Sami Valley. They were having trouble with the reactivity in the core, and they decided to pump the radioactive gases out of the core in order to try to see if they could uh, 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 solve the problem. It's just extraordinary. They had a power excursion, the power, which means the power goes on excursion, on a trip. It increases exponentially in fractions of a second. And they could barely shut the reactor down, but after a year and a half, uh, an hour and a half, only an hour and a half, of not being able to figure out what caused it, they started it up again and ran for another two weeks in the presence of very high radiation reading. It, the whole building at one time got contaminated from breaking a fuel rod, element off in the, in the reactor and and contaminated the whole complete building. We couldn't even get around the building for about almost two miles around the building. Again, no containment structure. Uh, radioactive material was put, uh, put into these uh, tanks and then intentionally uh, released into the atmosphere for weeks. You have to look back at the population density of the Santa Susana in, the, in that period. You were up there the other day, but at that time it was a dirt road to Santa Susana. Um, there was no population in the area. And the men asked him, can we tell our families about it? Can we tell it? We, it went right over our own homes. We live in Chatsworth, Canoga Park, all those areas. Can we let our wives know that what had happened? And they come back to him and says, no, you cannot. No, I don't want anybody saying a word about it. We'll report what happened to the public in our own due time. And then he turned around and come over to me where I'm standing there taping up the door and all that. And he looked got it, got right up next to me like a, a sergeant in the military right in my face and says, you will not say a word about what happened here today. And, and he really got stern about it, scared me half to death. 
in, in the fashion he had done that. So here I am talking to you right now. I was not supposed to say a word. And this is, is something I have to say to all of you. It was something very important. <laughs> Just give me a second. Important to me to be able to let you know what actually happened. It's been with me 55 years. I've known this, but I this is my first opportunity. Not that much of a hazard to even our local people, uh, as evidenced by the short period of time it took us to clean up the facility and recover it. What uh, uh, <coughs> fancy equipment were you provided to get the radioactivity off of these surfaces? High-tech equipment, which was uh, Bactine, which we've probably all seen in the drugstore. It's a uh, antiseptic solution, and we use uh, feminine napkins, Kotex, because they were highly, <laughs> highly absorbent uh, of whatever's on the floors and walls. So, so how... the radioactive contamination on the walls and floors was cleaned up using Kotex? Kotex and Bactine, yes. You told me once that as dangerous as the reactors were, there were more dangerous facilities on the property. Uh, what in particular? Well, we had several. The one that comes to mind to me is the uh, hot cell, which makes this, uh, it's even, I think, worse in many uh, uh, instances because at the hot cell, they dissected fuel elements, irradiated fuel elements there. And uh, so when you're doing that, uh, that's pretty risky business. Absolutely immense amounts of radioactivity were brought into the hot lab. This was uh, irradiated nuclear fuel from large reactors around the country. To draw you a quick picture of it, it's a it's a built obviously a building, but with all these individual cells in in inside, and uh, there was approximately eight or ten of them, and uh, they have these what they call manipulators. They're like slaves. And the walls uh, separating the workers and the fuel elements where the actual work went on are about eight foot th thick. And so you're looking through a leaded glass window in at this element that's probably reading in the, somewhere in the area of uh, two or 3,000 uh, R per hour, which is, is death if you were to be exposed to, to it directly. So they're decladding these fuel elements and that's creating dust and dirt and so on. Well, every, occasionally they would have a fire or a flood and what do the workers do? I mean, you run. You absolutely run when the fire alarm goes off or, or any other, other radiation alarm. You run because it may mean your life. Um, if there were a fire involving that radioactive material, the fire is a driving force that releases the radioactive material into the environment. And whichever way the wind blew, it would take it to populated areas. But there is another problem facing the people of our atomic city, a problem which is calling for the best efforts of our scientists. That is the matter of waste disposal. One of the foremost considerations of the Atomic Energy Commission is the safety of these people who work and live in cities near atomic plants. Therefore, waste material, which might be potentially dangerous, must be removed and stored safely. This work is vitally important. And did you have some role or some <coughs> recollection uh, that you wanted to pass on regarding the sodium burn pit? Oh, yes. Well, uh, for tell those you... Tell people what that was, first of all. Okay, it was a uh, pit where, uh, like a small lake, and they took the uh, various chemicals, and especially sodium and NAC. NAC and sodium are both, both used primarily for the coolants in the primary cooling system of reactors. It, it disperses the heat. Well, they would uh, take this used knack after it was removed from the reactor out, put it in drums, 55-gallon drums, take it to the sodium burn pit, uh, put it in a small rowboat, uh, one drum at a time, and uh, row it out to the center of the lake, push the drum in the water, and then get row back and get behind the coverage of uh, a, a blockhouse. And they would shoot the drum... Uh, with a 30 odd six rifle, therefore allowing the water to seep into the drum. And when water comes in contact with NAC or sodium, it's, it's a very uh, serious explosion. 
And this is the way that they allowed, they burned off this waste material, as well as other chemicals and so on. It was quite unusual. Uh, normally, you dispose of radioactive materials in specially designed and licensed radioactive waste facilities. So open air burning was not supposed to occur uh, for anything radioactive, but they did it anyway. So this burning was in the open air overlooking Simi Absolutely. Valley. And Absolutely. The smoke would travel all over the complex up there, including Rocketdyne and uh, the Atomics International Complex, and it would travel uh, into Simi Valley as well as the San Fernando Valley. And radioactive and chemical waste really weren't supposed to be burned there, just clean sodium, but they ended up do having a fair amount of radioactivity and chemicals, and we've got now contamination both in the groundwater beneath that site and some of it migrated off-site to what was then the Brandeis Camp Institute. Yes, that is true. There's, there was two, pit, two burn pits that I was familiar with. One was on the Rocket Iron side, and there's another one on, uh, on the uh, Nuke side, which was Atomics International. And my understanding, there was a, may have been a couple of others, but those are the two that I was, from, that I was familiar with. It went on for decades, and it was conducted in part because a uh, famous uh, memorandum by the company official that it was costly and took a lot of time to get the appropriate permits and ship the material off for appropriate disposal so it would be easier to burn it in these open pits. Ever stop to think that the breeze which rustles the flowers and trees and carries the scent of spring, the warmth of summer, and the spice of winter could be radioactive? Your lung tissue is very sensitive to radiation. The inhalation dose is ten times the skin dose. And so noble gases uh, are very penetrating. They can go right through a gas mask. They can go through activated charcoal. They will bathe the lungs with beta radiation and gamma radiation and can cause cancer in the lung tissue. Suppose you are a worker in an atomic energy plant located near one of these atomic cities. This is you coming home to your family. Aside from the usual safety precautions, what steps are taken to protect you at work? Matter of fact, there are many, so many, that working in these plants is among the safest occupations in the world. My name is Ralph Powell. I was a sergeant in security at Atomics International from 1962 to 1968. And I'm wondering, my question is, what's the chances of tracking in radiation to the family? I lost my only son from leukemia. 1967, my wife had breast cancer. Did you work at Santa Sue? Yes, I did. Your chances were very good because uh, all you were probably only wearing is a film badge, and, and I don't think you probably were required to monitor your clothing or yourself when you went home. And we had a lot, we had a lot of airborne, huge amounts of airborne activity being released from what we have about eight running reactors up there at any given time, and uh, you could run across it and not even know it. It would be, it could be airborne, or you could maybe touch something and still not realize it, and I would think that, uh, like where John worked, I mean, the activity was so high on the floors and the walls and in the parking lots on cars, so I would think that you're right on the money with that. So the SRE reactor, just my experience, 24-7 uh, radiation was coming out of that reactor going all over the hill. It could be the ones in Rockadine, it could be anywhere on the hill. You was being exposed every day you was there. Because with the SRE reactor, with the, t the type of works going on, and no containment building to hold it in, you, you went home with it on you. So that's what my wife worries about, too. Uh, so far, we have 3,700 claims from workers. I get phone calls every day from uh, surviving family members and community members. Uh, who have cancer. Uh, when I was first diagnosed in 1995, I did a survey in my neighborhood, and my houses, my, our houses were built in 1959, the same year as the partial meltdown, and I found that there were at least two cancers in every house. And I took a notepad and I went to every neighborhood around, and it was the same way. And all the houses that were um, old like mine, cancers. Three studies show black cancer in my census tract, and the sites closest to the hill are 50 to 55 percent higher. We have melanoma that's 89 percent above uh, what it should be. 
and that's continuing today. Um, the contamination is running off-site. In the late 90s, DOE funded an independent study. Uh, UCLA did the work, and they found um, higher higher death rates from blood, lymph, lymph cancers, and several other cancers. I was diagnosed in 1995 with a solid tumor, and my doctors asked me where I worked, and I said I worked at Atomics International, and they said they were treating a lot of employees, and they said, don't forget brain cancer. They had a whole ward over at the hospital with brain cancer. They didn't protect the workers. They didn't tell them what they were doing. They didn't warn them. Uh, and then when the workers got cancer and filed a lawsuit, the federal government fought them in court. So far, the workers have been compensated $154 million for their cancers. And I'm still working on it. Yes, our atomic city is exactly like any other. And special and detailed precautions are taken to keep these expanding communities that way. This golf course, for example, similar to thousands, just like it all over the country, with well-tended greens and tricky tracks. But if this player should send a long drive out of bounds, she might discover this man. He is protecting the people who live near an atomic installation by taking vegetation samples to test for the presence of radioactive material. William Preston Bowling, Aerospace Contamination Museum of Education. My question is for Robert Dodge. Um, during the couple of weeks of this meltdown, uh, they uh, released uh, radioactive gases into the air. And anyone who knows the history of Simi Valleys and the San Fernando Valleys, we had uh, milk and beef and oranges. Um, how does that affect those? Sure. Well, the, the thing about the radioactive isotopes is, is they're taken up by all living things as, as though they were essential life-giving uh, compounds. Uh, the, the strontium-90, the body looks at as potassium, I'm sorry, as, as calcium. Cesium looks like potassium to the body. Potassium is universally taken through all parts of the body. And again, they have half-lives of 30 years, but in medical terms, it takes 20 to 30 half-lives to make them inert. So that's 600 years they remain uh, effective. Uh, plutonium Plutonium-239 is the most toxic substance we know on the planet with a half-life of 24,000 years requiring a half million years to, radi to, make, to render it you know, medically inert. So these are incredibly toxic things. That's where, and we, again, we, we emphasize there is no safe level. You can take it in now, but it just sits there and, and, and emits and emits and emits and emits, okay? And if you're lucky and you don't get it in, within years or decades, I think that's great. But, I mean, you never know. You're never outside that risk. Another study was performed of the off-site population for, for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and they found that the incidence rate was more than 60% greater among residents living within a two-mile radius of the Santa Susana field, uh, <clears throat> more than among residents living more than five miles away. And these were for the following types of cancers. Cancers of the thyroid, upper aerodigestive, which is the mouth, nasal cavities, pharynx, larynx, and esophagus, the bladder and blood and lymph areas, uh, and blood tissues and chemistries like leukemias, lymphomas, and multiple myelomas. These are all areas where these radioisotopes settle there, like in the bladder and the colon, etc., and where they continue to have their ongoing effects. 216 times in recent years, 216 times, toxic materials have migrated off-site, okay, when they were picked up by rainwater and transported uh, into contaminated levels at areas in excess of recognized pollution limits. That is to say, levels deemed by regulators to be safe for public or the environment. <clears throat> Contaminated groundwater has also migrated off-site. The facility is on the hills above and, uh, above, and the contamination flows down to the, the city below. It is therefore extremely important from a health standpoint that all contamination that can be found is cleaned up so as to protect people and the environment from this radioactive and toxic pollution. Tonight, a new report is out about a nuclear accident here in the Southland almost 50 years ago. At the time, Rockadyne Lab near Simi Valley, uh, it happened there, and it says the accident did have long-lasting health effects. Channel 4's Patrick Healy live in Simi Valley right now with more on this story. Patrick. Colleen, over the years, suspicions of contamination released from the lab have, in effect, only been encouraged by the secrecy 
that long shrouded the nuclear and rocket testing. Studies now have demonstrated that a large amount of radioactivity apparently was released from that accident in 1959 and that uh, in the Los Angeles region at large, uh, uh, several hundred cancers are likely to have resulted. Many at this meeting are convinced illnesses in their family were caused by exposure from the Santa Susana lab. Well, we were horrified because we were raising our children here. This is like paradise. I mean, we all have creeks running through our yard. Our children played in the creeks when they were little. Soon after, a representative from Rocket 9 attended their homeowners association meeting. Oh, there was nothing to worry about. You know, you'd get more, more radiation if you flew to Denver. You also, we were told, you'd get more um, radiation sleeping next to your husband. Yeah. Or eating a banana. banana. By this time, Rocket 9 ownership had changed hands, and the corporate red tape got worse. The Goliath just kept getting bigger because we started out with Rockwell owning it, and they were big enough, but then you got Boeing. They're one of the biggest corporations in the world. For the next 20 years, there was constant struggle because the people who had run both the nuclear facility and the rocket testing were very resistant to take responsibility for the contamination that they had created. They just didn't want to have to clean it up. And the longer they delayed, the more stuff migrated off-site because every time it rained, the rain carried some of that toxic contamination that's in the soil off-site. The groundwater migrated off-site and the contamination in the soil when the wind blew would also be resuspended and move off-site. And years went by with people who are in this room giving up a huge amount of their life seeing their children grow up, and now their grandchildren, they thought, would finally be protected. About 30 of you went up to Sacramento to meet with the then Secretary of Cal EPA, Linda Adams, who had been convinced by her staff that things were okay and that any real attempt to clean it, things up the way we wanted to wasn't practical. And one member of that citizen's delegation was a mother whose child had been diagnosed with retinoblastoma. It's a horrible cancer of the eye that appears in young children a few months after birth. The child has to have the eye surgically removed, and, or both eyes uh, occasionally, and then undergo, through, undergo chemo. And there had been a cluster, eight or nine kids in a tiny area of about 30,000 people. This normally occurs in one in a million um, births. Uh, or one in a million people, I don't remember which way, but anyway, a huge number um, of uh, retinoblastomas. And we saw on Secretary uh, Adams' face something change. A senior bureaucrat, a senior official, whose heart melted, and who then turned to her staff person and began to understand that what she had been told wasn't true that the operator of the facility, which is Boeing, has very powerful lobbyists, had been able to, through her staff, which was fairly close to Boeing, get her to do something that she later, regret, later regretted. And so she reversed course and committed to trying to get this site cleaned up. Um, during the time that she was secretary, uh, then-Senator Sheila Kuehl and uh, then-Assembly member Julia Brownlee with a large number of others, quite bipartisan in fact, managed to get legislation through that was signed by the governor, SB 990, that required the cleanup of the site to the most protective standards, which are the rural residential standards. The Department of Energy, NASA, and Boeing currently are responsible for the cleanup. Last December, the DOE and NASA agreed to clean up their portions to the highest of standards. But Boeing has not. It's suing the state of California because it feels the cleanup standards are unconstitutional. Boeing spokesperson Blake Jamison told us decades of extensive sampling have shown there is no evidence of contamination that has adversely affected the surrounding community. The government promised to clean it up, and now politics looks like it may never get cleaned up and these people may remain at risk. Tonight in Simi Valley, many neighbors agree fines and cleanup efforts have been inadequate. What assurances can we give them? that if they purchase this land to build their homes on or to keep this land for gardening or what have you, that it's safe. If you want to feel more protected, you need to get the site cleaned up so there's no longer a source. That's, the rest of it 
it, it, there's not much we can do. But to get rid of that source, that's the key thing that we have to do. The contamination on the hill that wants to go off the hill. On your travels across the continent, you may pass through several atomic cities. Some are large, some are small. But they are all good cities to live in, in which to raise your family, make friends, and enjoy a full life. Atomic cities, cities near atomic laboratories, will become more numerous as nuclear energy work expands, as we continue to travel into the atomic age. So continue your journey across the country. Who knows? Possibly your own community may one day become an atomic city through the magic of the atom. <laughs>